Professor Di Ritlaidi from the University of Pretoria has now been elected as a judge on the International Court of Justice for a nine-year term. He becomes the first person from South Africa to serve as a judge of this court. President Cyril Ramaphosa has congratulated Professor Clady on Friday after his nomination by the South African government earlier this year. In fact, it was in May. The International Court of Justice consists of 15 judges who are elected by the UN General Assembly. So let's get your reaction about this massive achievement. Speak to the Prof himself, who joins us now via our video link. And Professor Clady, it's a great honor. Congratulations are in order. I can only imagine what the past few days have been feeling like, given just how much attention this has garnered, and rightly so. Um, but, but the last time you and I were able to sit down together in the lead-up to the election, you were very, you were at pains to explain that there's no telling how this will go, because there was fierce campaigning at the time for these positions. With the benefit of hindsight, what do you reckon made the difference? Uh, I mean, I, I hope, I, I think, yeah, I hope um, it's a... Um, uh, the main deciding factor was, as I mentioned at that interview that we had, was the quality of the candidates. You know, as, as I said to you, my message to my interlocutors throughout was, this is the International Court of Justice. I know that elections um, at the UN tend to be very political. You take all kinds of things into account. But my hope is that quality at the end of the day, you know, is um, the winner. And I hope that that was the deciding factor. Um, so, but I must tell you, Ayanda, it was a very, very close election. Uh, at least it seemed very close in the Security Council. The General Assembly wasn't so close, um, but in the Security Council, it was a very close election. We had to go five rounds. It was very tense. Um, there were moments when I thought, well, that's it. The dream is over. Um, but yeah, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, I'm glad that it, at the end, I'm glad that, um, that, um, that the result was as I hoped it would be. Yeah, and as the President put it, you know, it's a great personal achievement, but also feels like a great achievement for the country itself. What perhaps this moment also allows us to do is to, you know, kind of spread education around what the court actually does. I mean, uh, we were able to touch on that briefly when we spoke, but um, for the benefit of people who now have a newfound interest in this, now that we're also represented at that court, how would you describe the kind of work it does in this jurisdiction? Yeah. I mean, the function of the court is described as, uh, it's described as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Um, and, I mean, there are many courts internationally, um, but this is without question the apex court in the system, in the, um, so in the system of international law. And it's, 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 its main function is to resolve disputes between states. If there's a dispute between state, uh, or between states, then it would, regardless of the subject matter jurisdiction, um, um, it would fall within the jurisdiction of the court. So there are many courts internationally, but most courts have uh, subject matter limitations. So, for example, you've got uh, the International Criminal Court. Um, its subject matter jurisdiction is limited to international criminal matters. Um, and of course, it's also a court that 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 that, that is concerned with the um, the guilt um, or innocence of individuals. But the International Court of Justice has no subject matter limitation. Uh, so as long as it's a dispute between states, it would fall um, um, so within the jurisdiction of the court, regardless of what the subject is. And so whether it's human rights, whether it's boundary issues, whether it's, it's law of the sea, whether it's environmental issues, whether it's criminal matters, it all falls within the jurisdiction of the court. Um, um, it also has jurisdiction in something called advisory opinions, which is where there isn't necessarily a dispute, or at least the, the case wouldn't necessarily be about a dispute between states, um, but it is where an organ of the United Nations or some other international organization with competence requested for an advisory opinion. Um, and, and, and this very often provides the court with an opportunity to sort of address critical international law issues um, on which it's not able to find jurisdiction because um, states haven't consented to the particular state-to-state um, -state jurisdiction. And so a, 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 a typical example of this um, is um, the situation in Palestine, which incidentally will be um, the first case in which I will have the opportunity to sit. Um, the General Assembly requested an advisory opinion on um, um, the obligations um, on the states of Israel. Um, you know, another one is on climate change. So there's an advisory opinion pending before the International Court of Justice on um, the obligations of states with respect um, to climate change. Um, a, a, Big historical advisory opinion from the 1970s actually concerned South Africa and uh, the application of apartheid policies in Namibia. Um, um, so the Namibia opinion. So these advisory opinions are also really important in right. terms of 
um, setting out what the rules are in international law. Absolutely. And, and what a time to be appointed to that particular court, right? Because uh, as you and I speak, there's active war on at least three continents. You've already mentioned one yeah. in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. Uh, there's also one in Europe between Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, another one, often forgotten one is the war in, in the Congo here on the African continent. Um, and what these moments, I suppose, will do is really put a spotlight on the effectiveness of these transnational institutions to be able to yeah. essentially carry out the mandate that you've just explained to us. Does this feel like yeah. the weight of the world on your shoulders in some way? Well, it's not the, you know, one of the things I try to tell people, and even in the course of the campaign process, uh, a couple of the questions that I received was about um, um, the, the effectiveness of the rulings of the ICJ. One of the points I always make <clears throat> is that the ICJ is a, is a cog in a system, um, and all that the ICJ can do is, is at least make clear what the rules are. Um, you know, but once the court has made a ruling, uh, you know, you mentioned, for example, uh, um, so the Russia invasion of, of um, Ukraine, that's an active matter um, before the, um, the, um, so the court. Um, the court can only make a ruling about what the rules are, um, you know, what the obligations of the parties are, and what the parties should do to act in compliance with international law. But after that, there's still more important things to happen to make sure that the ruling of the court is complied with. So, so no, I mean, I don't <clears throat> feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I feel like um, I have a responsibility, like the other judges, um, to make sure that we clarify the rules. But ultimately, there's a system, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's for that whole system to work together. Um, the ICJ is a very important cog in that system, but it is just the cog in the system. Um, you know, and at least that's my, that's mm. my approach to the court. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that, right? You, you can only kind of clarify what the law is, but there needs to be a separate enforcing agent. And this comes at a yeah. time where it feels like there's a galvani galvanization of this kind of new world order, where even the United Nations as an institution is no longer seen as, as the pinnacle of, you know, what multilateralism ought to look like, you know? Um, for instance, there are people speaking out, even in the Israeli government, very openly about their objections to how the United Nations runs things. Uh, and I wonder to what extent that kind of complicates our ability to have those recommendations enforced, as you've outlined. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I personally think that the UN still works. I mean, I think that there, there, you know, there are a lot of uh, flaws. But again, ultimately, um, it's a responsibility of states. Um, and um, um, so Israel is not the only state to, to find itself um, so in a situation where it seems as if the spotlight is on it. Um, we found ourselves in that situation in the past, and ultimately I think it's, it's for, uh, one, for us to wait for the ruling of the ICJ, um, you know, and, and then secondly, once that ruling comes out, the advisory opinion comes out, um, to ensure that, that sufficient pressure is brought to bear to make sure that the decisions are complied with. And that's the responsibility of every state, by the way, right? It's not just the responsibility of the state um, to which uh, the advisory opinion is, is, is addressed. In fact, the, the advisory opinion will essentially be addressed to the General Assembly, and it will say, uh, here are the obligations um, on the General Assembly to ensure that there's compliance with international law. So ultimately, each and every state, um, then bears responsibility to ensure that um, um, the um, the findings of the court, in a sense, mm. um, are complied with. Yeah. Again, uh, in the lead-up to your election, uh, we had spoken about all kinds of things, including representation at this court. And, you know, that's one of the things, I think, um, that made the stakes much higher for someone like you to be appointed. Now that you're in the, the court itself, what do you make of its makeup? Because there are 15 judges in total, including yourself. And I wonder if you reckon the General Assembly went far enough in getting that right? Well, I mean, I think there's, a, there's been, and I'm not going to, um, to specify whether I like the developments or not, but there's been a couple of interesting developments in the last uh, two big elections. I mean, there was a, um, uh, what they call a, a, um, a, a, an election to fill a vacancy uh, uh, last year. But the two big elections are this one and I think an election in 2019. Um, and two things happened there that are that I think are very significant. Um, in this election, um, the Russian judge who was running for re-election um, did not win. In the election in 2019, um, the, the judge for the United Kingdom who was running for re-election did not win. Um, in 2019, when that happened, it was the first time that um, the P5 would 
that a member of the P5 would not be represented on the court. Mm. Right? So the first time it, since the beginning of the court, there's always been a judge from one of these five states. So in 2019, that was the first time that didn't happen. And now with this election, it's two judges, um, it's two um, P5 states that are not represented. And I think that's very significant in terms of the composition of the court and uh, geopolitical representation. In fact, a friend of mine um, um, mentioned to me yesterday, said, you, you realize that now actually uh, the P5 is not represented, but BRICS is represented, right? Uh, well, um, at least IPSA um, is represented, and that says something about the... the, the um, the, um, so perhaps the geopolitical shift. And I think that that's, I think there is something very significant about that. Yeah. Um, the second point I'd make about, um, so representation is, 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 uh, before this election, um, so Africa was represented by, 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 uh, by three judges. After this election, Africa is represented by three judges. And so mm. th- there isn't really a shift. Mm-hmm. What I think is important, and why I think I I I, I worked so so hard to um, to actually get elected, is I also think it's important um, that um, the um, the judges from our continent that are represented are um, those judges that are able to sort of shift, um, if you like, um, the um, the um, the trajectory of the court that are able to shift the way in which the court functions. It's not just about um, being there, it's also about the ability to um, to uh, to influence, and I think that that's that's significant. I certainly think um, that I'll be able to influence um, that, um, you know, and I, I, that's really the message that I was sending at least um, mm. to African and Tokyo. Yeah, just look at the profile. Absolutely, and it's a neat way for me to segue into uh, my next question. You know, judges, traditionally speaking are not meant to have any kind of ideological leaning, but, uh, and you've answered this in some ways, I wonder what you're hoping nonetheless your contribution will be to this particular court. And I'm thinking more legacy type of contribution, right? Um, because we all enter these spaces with certain beliefs, sometimes ideas about how they should be run. And I, want, and I wonder what that is for you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. So what uh, I'll say a couple of things about that. So one thing I'll say is, um, so first of all, there's a couple of ways in which one can leave one's legacy, uh, you know, on the court. Uh, the easiest way is just to write, you know, separate opinions and dissenting opinions. And I hope I don't have to do that. I don't want my legacy to be, oh, the railroad, such a nice dissenting opinion or such a nice separate opinion and it's been quoted. The legacy that I want to leave behind is actually influencing the court, which means that very little will be written about it. Um, but as long as the, 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 the court shifts, um, you know, in a particular direction, whether or not that shift is attributed to me is, is besides the point, but that's the legacy that I want. Now, what does that mean in terms of the question that you ask about ideologies and so on? I think that we all have ideologies, right? We all have ideological leanings, and I don't think that one should be shy about that. Um, the function of a judge, in my opinion, is to look at the arguments, listen to the arguments, and read the papers, and and, and and make determinations objectively on the basis of what's in front of you. But you are going to be influenced by your ideological opinions. And my ideological approach, um, I've also been very clear about that. It's in my, my campaign literature. I've spoken about it whenever I've been asked uh, by interlocutors. Is I hope to see a much more um, solidarity-based, solidarity-infused international. I can't create that. Right, so that has to be that has to be um, um, that's the, the the perspective through which I will listen to the arguments. But ultimately, I have to be objective. I do have a perspective. That perspective will influence. But my role is still to be objective in sort of assessing the so the various arguments. And so there will be times. There should be times when I have to um, vote in a direction that's not completely comfortable with my policy perspective. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't have a policy perspective. It just means that on the particular day, in the particular case, I was influenced by the argument. I was convinced by arguments, and those arguments might not necessarily be um, um, be in alignment with my policy perspective. And that's okay, because we all have policy perspective, but we also have jobs. And my job would be that as a judge, and the job of a judge is to weigh arguments that are made on the basis of law and how convincing those arguments are.
Sure. Fascinating stuff. Look, if this discussion is anything to go by, I know the court is in firm and safe hands. Once again, congratulations to you. And yeah, hopefully the work that you set out to do works out, given just how important it is, especially in our times. Once again, Professor Dire Tladi, recently appointed to the International Court of Justice, UN body there. Thanks very much indeed for speaking to us.